K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at sales at k98fm.com. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on K98talk.com. Welcome to Opinion Nation. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an ideal that all of us are created in. I, too, am America. Now, here's your host, Bryce Robbins. Hello, everyone, and I'm glad to be back after a week hiatus. Um, so, I'll let you actually know where I was. I do this program known as JSA. Uh, many of you might know it. It's called the Junior Statesman of America. It's a great program. It's for high school students to engage in basically political activism and to understand how politics works. Um, I'm actually running for a position, uh, a regional vice mayor of my home state, New Jersey. And I had to speak in front of over a thousand people. It was nerve-wracking, but I felt good about it. Um, you can go like my page, Bryce for Vice, and uh, hopefully I win. I actually got to run into Rick Santorum. It was it was pretty cool. I, he was in the elevator. Uh, he gave a keynote address, so I guess that's what happens when your dreams and aspirations for presidency fail. You end up giving speeches to high schoolers. Um, but before his horrendous speech that made me want to tear my eyes out about just awful things. Um, I actually ran into him in the elevator and I asked him, uh, you know, what was it like being at the presidential debates? And he told me they were nerve wracking, but fun. And as I walked away, I, I told Rick, the only thing I could think about was, God, I should have asked him, have you ever looked him up? Have you ever looked yourself up on Urban Dictionary? And I really wonder if he has. He, he must know. And if you don't know, prepare your stomachs and go look it up. But anyways, you know, I always tell you guys I'm a liberal and Obama and I love you. But this week, Obama, I am mad at you and I'll give you two reasons why. So we're going to start off today. We're going to talk about, uh, first we're going to talk about GMOs for the first half of the show. If you don't know what GMOs are, you will in a minute. And then second... We're going to be talking about standardized tests, because lucky little old me, I have to take the park exam. And boy, do I not want to take the park exam. But anyways, we will start off with GMO mutant food. So you might have heard, uh, you know, GMOs have been big in the news. Uh, the first GMO crops were planted in 1994. And I like to always give everybody a little historical background. I, at least in the United States, they were planned in 1994. So, all right, that being said, before that, crops were obviously non-GMO. Now, 74% of the crops that we consume from the, uh, from the grocery store in the United States are, have GMOs in them, genetically modified organisms. And in Europe, it's about 5%. Now, uh, a lot of us might have heard Neil deGrasse Tyson, a uh, famous astrophysicist scientist, talk about genetically modified foods. And to a large extent, he was, well, actually no, not to a large extent, to the full extent, he was supporting them. He was saying that if you're against them, it's because you're scared of science, you don't know. And the fact of the matter is, I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I actually once found his office at the Hayden Planetarium, where I've attended numerous times, and left him a note on his door where he never responded. But I was 13 at the time. I'm not creepy. But um, he talked about how 
There's no such thing as wild seedless watermelons. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, succulent, uh, red delicious apples. But there's a difference between hybridization and actually genetically altering the DNA structure of a food to make it different than it naturally is supposed to be. So I think the best example of this is the banana. You see, the banana in the 1950s was almost gone. And if you've ever had a banana tasting candy and wondered, hey, this tastes nothing like banana, it's really sweet, that's because it doesn't taste like our banana. There's two, the, the original type of banana was called the Grove Michelle. That's the scientific name for it. You can look it up. It's rather big. It's a lot thicker. And it had a lot more seeds, but it was very, very sweet. In the 1950s, it started to die out, and it effectively did. But scientists were able to preserve certain genes and pass along what we have today, the Cavendish, which is the tasty, delicious, potassium-enriched banana. And that is not bad. Because it is not anything that is not necessarily unnatural. It's just hybrid, hybridization. It's uh, selective traits that are passed on. The problem that I have is a different type of genetic modification. So it's basically, before I get into my main arguments here and my main concerns about this uh, topic, it's like talking about cars. You have Fords, Toyota, Cam um, Honda, whatever you want to talk about, Chevy. And it, it's kind of like that with GMOs. You have, you can't just say cars are bad. You can't say cars are dangerous. You could say that Toyota is dangerous because they forget to, you know, I mean, or excuse me, GM is dangerous because they forget to fix their brakes because, you know, 13 people die. But you're not going to say all cars are dangerous. That's just, that's not truthful. So I'm going to say that when you do specific genetic altercations to a crop that effectively alters exactly what that crop is naturally going to do, that is bad. When you hybridize and when you selectively pass on traits to different plants, well, that is different. And that I'm okay with because then we get seedless crops. We get uh, succulent, delicious strawberries and things of that nature. But I would like to now move on to the bad stuff, that stuff that makes me angry and the stuff that makes me want to, well, gets me mad at Obama. So in 2010, Obama made a statement that said, I want GMO labeling, or he probably said it, uh, I uh, want uh, GMO uh, labeling, something like that. And you forgot to say, let me be clear. Oh, Rick is right. I forgot to say, uh, let me be clear. Uh, I forgot that uh, I said that, and I would like a GMO uh, labeling. But his he is a stuttering fool, and you know what he did? Like He just lied to us. Because although he might have envisioned that, you know who he appointed to be the FDA deputy of food? Former vice president of, drumroll please, Monsanto. His name is Michael Taylor. And if that is not corruption, then I don't know what is. Because guess who companies like Monsanto, Dow, Asigna go to when they have a new food patent? Hmm. Just, just take a minute. Yes. Yep. You got it. Yep. It's the FDA food deputy, Michael Taylor, the guy who used to work for Monsanto. So you wonder why all these food intellectual patents get passed so quickly. Now, let me give you a little background on what an intellectual food patent is, is when Monsanto figures out how to make its new mutant corn, they pass intellectual property patents on it so that nobody else can grow it or copy it. And then guess who does the testing for it? Yeah, you guessed it, Monsanto. They do their own testing. And then they say, it's safe, here's the results. And... That's where my first clip is going to come in. You see, Monsanto did a three month test on a rat, but well, it was for corn and it was genetically modified corn, but it was only three months long. And at the three month marker, it showed that there was nothing wrong with the rat. But Rick, if you could play that first clip, I would like to enlighten the listeners on what happened to that rat after longer testing. 
French Prime Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault says he's prepared to call for a wider European ban on genetically modified produce following an alarming new study that throws the safety of the food into doubt. The report claimed that 200 rats fed GM corn produced by US firm Monsanto had suffered tumours as big as ping pong balls. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, 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 that, that, that is true. And that test actually lasted six months. And that is when those large lesions and tumors start to show up. So, and here's where it gets even scarier, is that these companies don't need to tell us what's in our food. So I did a little experiment <clears throat> and I called up Kraft, you know, the macaroni and cheese, that's what they're famous for. I called up uh, the makers of Chef Boyardee. I called up, uh, who else did I call? I called the, actually I called the people who provide food to my school and there's one more, and if I think of it, I will... Oh, Progresso, excuse me, the soup soup company. Uh, they do the canned soup. And, you know, I asked each one of them. I said, uh, hi, I'm curious to know exactly what I'm eating. And I would like to know, are these crops that are... Or are these grains, the pasta are, are, that are in my food, are they from genetic modif genetic modified organisms? I also asked about the meat product and the chicken products, the basic... Um, yeah, meat and chicken. And I said, how are these farmed? Do you know if there was antibiotics in them? If there was um, hormones injected into them? And I got an answer that they told me. And I hung up the phone and I, I, I was like, wait a minute. Did they just say that? <clears throat> First off, none of them would answer me about their meat and dairy and dairy products. They said that they didn't, they could not tell us. And I, and I, and I asked, can I be put through to someone who does know? Because that was their main response. They say, sorry, we don't have that information at this time. So first off, they wouldn't tell me where the meat and dairy products are from. Second off, when I asked about the GMOs, every single one gave the same response. They said it's non-GMO. It, wait, excuse me. It is non-non-GMO, a double negative right there. And then, you know, you have to think about it. They say, wait, wait, non-non-GMO. That means there's GMOs in it. And they it's these tricky ways that they go around doing it. But companies like Monsanto really screw America because, A, they don't tell you what's in your food. They're driven by profit and they're destroying farms because what happens is they release these studies, air quotes, that say, oh, genetic modified crops yield longer. Well, that is not true. They actually destroy the groundwater because, well, I'll get into it. Hang on. They destroy the groundwater. They uh, hurt uh, soil. And inevitably, they make it harder to uh, produce crops in the future. But that in regards to farmers, they grow quicker yields. So that means more profit for farmers. So, of course, they grow, go on with Monsanto and they use their seeds that I remember I said before. They're patented. Now, the problem is, is that it's a cyclical cycle because let's say I'm a farmer, okay, and I start using Monsanto seeds for corn. And my yield is growing and it's pest resistant. Okay. Second yield comes, it's less pest resistant because the pests, the caterpillars, the flies, whatever, have built up resistances. The weeds all built up resistances to my crop. Well, now I need stronger pest resistance. Guess who I go to? Monsanto, because they're a chemical company and they make that stuff. And it's a cyclical cycle. And ultimately, and it ends up hurting the earth, which is where my product, my food is coming from, and it hurts me, the farmer. And there have even been cases where Monsanto has sued farmers because during the pollination of their plants, the seeds have been picked up and blown to another farm where they have grown in that soil and said that they were these farmers were infringing on their patents. So they sued the crap out of these farmers. And, you know, it scares me that these big corporations such as Monsanto, Cigna, and Dow are, are in our food. And it scares me so much that I saw a study that was, that came out that said that in certain Western states where uh, food cultivation is very high in the United States, that they were starting to trace Roundup in people's piss. Yeah, Roundup, you know, the, the pesticide. I mean, that's not good. So... My message is, is that we don't need all these pesticides. We don't need all these herbicides. 
we don't need all this crap going on our food because it ends up getting into our bodies. We urinate it and it's in our bodies. And one study showed that after two decades of having uh, GMO products in a rat, or I think I think what they did was they put the, the amount of uh, content of GMOs into the rat for the amount of time that it would be two decades for a human or something like that. And it started to have lesions on its reproductive organs and it started to affect reproductive organs. And around the same time that the study came out, I believe it was in 2012, Europe began their bans, Poland began their ban, uh, Russia actually stopped importing genetically modified crops from the United States. And all I'm asking is for the United States government to do what's right and implement food labeling so that we know what we're eating. Because you'll hear, you're going to hear people like Kevin O'Leary when he combated that little girl who was 13 on, on her uh, TV saying you're selfish because there are starving children who need genetically modified crops or else they'll starve. But that's not true. These companies are hurting people. They are, it's a cyclical cycle that is ultimately hurting farmers and the people who consume the food. And it's sick and it's it's gross because I I called up these companies and I urge you to do it as well. Ask them what's in your food and you're not really going to find out. I, I called my school food lunch company. They, they wouldn't tell me. I mean, c consider this. Would you eat something if you didn't know who was in it? Because it's exactly what we're doing. And then you want to talk about... Um, uh, meat and dairy products, it's even worse because A, they're factory. A lot of meat and chicken products are factory farmed and they're loaded up on antibiotics, which gets into our, our systems, our uh, body. And then when we get sick and need to take antibiotics, they're not strong enough. What food companies are doing is they're worrying about profit and they're doing exactly what companies are supposed to do, worry about profit. But, but this is an industry that affects so many people, we are guinea pigs to these companies and their tests. And it needs to stop. Because I don't understand one thing. We all might remember the, the recent Supreme Court case where I, um, oh, I forget the name of the company. It was a genetic, uh, it was a genetic company where uh, they were doing like gene sequencing and they tried to uh, put a patent on the BRAC gene, the P51 uh, gene. It's in most breast cancer and they would be the only ones who could study it. And the Supreme Court ruled that you can't patent a human's gene, but we can patent food genes. And ultimately, we can patent what you eat. And it's dangerous. And Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas actually used to work for Monsanto. And all these companies keep giving us food, saying it's good for you, it won't hurt you. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know what's in this food. We don't know if it's going to hurt us. In fact, one type of corn that Monsanto puts out, it's one of their largest yields around the world. It's called BT corn. And I urge you to look it up. Because not only is it a type of corn, it's a type of pesticide. Yes, wait, did I just say that? Yes, it is. It is a type of pesticide. You know that stuff you use to kill bugs? It's been labeled a type of pesticide. So you are eating pesticides when you eat BT corn. Now, GMOs are found largely in canola, soy, and corn. That's their main, um, the, the main things in the United States. And we're talking about 91%, 90% are uh, GMO filled. So that is scary. And we, it's, it's almost unavoidable. So that's why we need legislation that will effectively lay out labels that says this is GMO, this is not. And then I believe if you know a little bit about economics, I'll lay a definition on you here. It's called consumer sovereignty. I believe that people will avoid those packages and switch over because this fucking mutant food is disgusting and it's causing cancer. And we wonder why we have... Rate, uh, rapid cancer growth in this country, it's because we're eating 
sick, untested mutant food, and the little tests that are done are done by the companies independently. So I'm going to leave you on that, and I'm going to go to commercial break. But one last thought before I do go to commercial break is the next time you go to uh, eat something, whether it's at McDonald's or it's at, I don't know, even your local Whole Foods, just think before you eat and just wonder where your food came from and maybe give them a call. And actually, wait, before I go to commercial break, I would just like to say hats off in respect to uh, Stephen Colbert. Uh, what is it? Uh, flip of the hat, tip of the finger or something to uh, uh, Chipotle because they grow their food farm raised. And when they don't, when there's a shortage of that, it's unavailable, they'll tell you. So you know what? Hats off to them because they're an $11 billion company and they're doing the right thing. So maybe today go to Chipotle and have a delicious burrito because I will probably end up doing that because I do not want to eat the sick mutant food any longer because I don't know what it is. I don't know where it came from and nobody will tell me. So maybe when someone has cancer, we'll wonder why and maybe we'll think because they were eating food and it's through no fault of their own. I mean, it's through no fault of these, uh, but these companies, these giant companies that are mega lobbying uh, forces on Washington and they have their own people riddled throughout Washington. So do your research, be scared, be effective and speak out against it. And I'll be right back after this break to talk about standardized testing. Rick, if you could take me out. Tune into The Family Factor with Denny C. every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at 5 a.m. as he looks at all the challenges facing the family today. Denny will give you a refreshingly new look at tackling some of the biggest issues. So start your day off on the right foot with Denny C. and The Family Factor right here on K98talk.com. I'm Steve Long of Liberty Unfiltered. If you're tired of hearing the same Republican and Democrat banner from the mainstream media, join me on Wednesday nights at 9, H Central, as I crawl out of the cesspool of partisan politics and bring the fight for freedom against the advocates of big government to the masses. This is Misty, owner of Waxit Studio in Edmond, Oklahoma, and I'm here to talk to you about a skincare product called Theramedics. Theramedics has a wonderful line of products from anti-aging to hyperpigmentations all the way to acne. In fact, everyone at some point in our lives is affected by acne. Acne can cause a great deal of embarrassment and anxiety. And in order to prevent and help other people, I have tapped into this wonderful product called Theramedics. Visit my website at www.prettyskindeep.com. Again, that's www.prettyskindeep.com. You're back, sir. Bryce, are you still there? Did I lose you?
Yeah, hello? We've, I, we've been live for about 30 seconds now, sir. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. I didn't hear anything. Okay. That was um, Okay, so welcome back. Um, I'm Bryce Robbins, and actually that song that Rick picked last was so... Ended it perfectly by saying we can choose it. But uh, okay. So yes, choose your food wisely. But now we're going to move on to my second topic, uh, standardized tests. And I, you might have heard me a little bit in the previous show, uh, Finding Common Ground with Rick and Dave, talking about how these standardized tests really, they're not doing their job. So of course, going to give you a history lesson. So standardized tests were really implemented in the early 1900s in schools in the United States for the sole purpose of, of doing exactly what they're promoted to do is, is uh, standardize what everybody should know, make sure everybody gets it, and then moves on. But the population of students was a lot different in the early 1900s. They were largely white. They were largely men. And they largely didn't exceed going to, into the 10th grade. So if all these people were the same, then yeah, it was, it was largely homogeneous. That's why Finland and Sweden and all those places do so well, because largely the community is homogeneous and they're, they're largely the same. But now we have more girls in school than boys. We have more um, uh, people of different color, ethnicity, background in schools integrated. Uh, we've had a lot of change throughout how our communities have grown. We have greater income inequality in this nation, which means that we have a lot more poor people. In fact, there was one study that suggested that 50% of all children who are attending middle school are below the poverty line. Yikes. And you know what that says is that they can't afford the tutors, the, the uh, help that they need to get ahead when compared to wealthier students, which is where these tests discriminate. Because someone who's rich can afford the best tutors, the best books, the best help. But someone who's poor cannot. And unfortunately, in our society, what we're doing with this awful idea of common core curriculum, which is again where I'm getting angry at Obama, is, well, you, we're not standard people, okay? I, I know a lot of kids in my school who they're not they're not driven by school they're not driven to uh, excel in math and science and you know largely this is based on the community that you're raised in or the background that you're raised in luckily i have uh, a wonderful family i i'm not from a broken home i'm from a very loving family so of course i'm nurtured and i'll do well and a lot of it is nurture versus the nature factor but then you have someone who comes from a broken home, who is not well off, whose parents are maybe abusive, whose education is not fostered. And of course, they're, they're not the same and they don't have the same aspirations as I would or as somebody else would. So to say that we must figure out a way across the board to standardize education and figure out where everybody's at. Well, it is obvious that those in worse areas are going to do worse and those in better areas are going to do better. And ultimately, not everyone wants to be an engineer or mathematician. People don't really care about how well you did on your, uh, you know, uh, FCAT or NJASC or whatever, or your park exam. And that is really what was inspired this, uh, this bit is the park exam. Because next week, I have to take the park exam. It's called the Partnership for Assessment of uh, Readiness for College and Careers. But you know what? Ultimately... It's a sham, okay? Because if, if a certain percentage of your students fail it and you have tenure, you can lose your tenure. If you are a teacher of special education, guess who's still taking this test? Your children, even if they are special ed. Everybody is across the board is taking this park exam, but we are not the same people and I don't want to be treated as if I am the same as someone who wants to major in math or someone who loves to read and write. Personally, me, I love to talk and listen, and I love history. And I love my economics class. And I'm not gonna get tested on that. I will on the AP tests, but I won't here uh, in this regard. And I feel largely that these tests are testing kids 
to grow math, science, and engineering. But in most schools around the country, we don't have shop class anymore. We don't uh, have large vocational uh, schools. And when we do, they're largely looked down upon. So the idea that everybody is the same and we can all climb the same tree and get to the same ending is false. We are setting our, ourselves up for failure. And standardized testing is a horrible, horrible method for testing education. We've never done this before in human history. Okay. We're just being taught to a test. And yes, it could stop, you know, a rogue teacher because now they have to teach you a test. But, <clears throat> and, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be testing the proficiency of our students, but do we really think it's right to across the board test everybody see exactly what they know? No, it is, it is not okay. It, it's just wrong. And the fact that so much is weighed on these standardized tests, and let's talk about the SAT and ACTs. They're done by this company called College Board, who has millions of dollars in lobbying power, who make millions of dollars of having a monopoly over the SATs and ACTs, or SATs, excuse me. And they do the PSATs, they do all these tests, and people are taught to these tests. And you know what's actually happening? We're seeing a surge in student stress in high school, actually, there are recent studies showed that stress among students is at the highest level it's ever been. And high school students are actually at the highest rate of suicide of any of any, uh, in, in this country of any other nation uh, of the first world, excuse me. So I, I have to put that in. Um, so we wonder, like, why do we weigh so much on our education on these tests? Because uh, I, I did this in the last show, and I and I, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but let's be real. I am not a very old person. I'm still in high school. And I just won the number one in my county in debate team. I am on National Honor Society. I'm on Science Association. I'm the class president. I'm running for a regional position that I mentioned earlier. And I do this radio show. And you're going to tell me that because I filled in C rather than A, that I am not proficient or that I am not going to succeed at the same level as somebody else. Now, maybe it's because I'm different, because I don't have the same interests. Look, I love science, and I used to want to be an engineer when I was a little younger. And I did all these engineering programs or whatever. And I realize I'm just not, a, I'm not that's not me. I, I, I don't do suit well in math and I don't suit well in uh, that type of environment. And honestly, I, I don't feel the need to have my life guided because how I do my SATs. And that's why I love the idea of SAT and ACT optional schools. Because more and more schools are starting to realize that these tests are pointless. They're not testing anything. They're testing how well you could prepare and they're testing how much money you put into it. Because the more money, statistically speaking, the more money you put into your test taking, the more, uh, the higher score you're going to have in the end. So, A, these tests discriminate based on how much money you have. When that was the whole objective of them is to prove that that an A at this school is the same as an A in another school. So that myth is debunked. Second, it's supposed to make it so that everybody is at least accomplishing the same material across the board. But let's be real here. We are, again, not the same people. And I believe, in all honesty, and I really i am open, I want to hear what everybody has to think, so tweet me at O-P-N-A-T News, or uh, tweet me at Robins Bryce, uh, R-O-B-I-N-S, B-R-Y-C-E, and tell me what you think. How should we reorganize our education? Because I'm far in favor of having this liberal arts type setup that public school seems to be. We push people towards music class and art class and marketing class and history class and math class and, and science class and yada, yada, yada. But I think it should be more an academy setup. So if you love science, you go do science. It, 
Uh, if you love math, go do math. If you love uh, history, go do history. If you love economics, go do economics. If you love government, go do government. If you love vocation uh, or those types of skills, go do those. Now, I don't really know what age you would pick up on that uh, because I would have been in engineering academy uh, when I was younger and I probably wouldn't be here now. But, you know, maybe if I was taught to that, I would have liked it better. Now, me, I, I was when I was uh, little, I did have a learning disability and um, it was harder for me to read and do math problems. But I was still tested the same exact way as other students. I have an IEP, which is an individual education plan. And it is well documented that I'm not the same type of learner as the valedictorian. Now, I, I'll give you a full disclosure. I have a 3.7 out of 4 GPA, which is really good. I'm ranked 43 of 200. That's very good. It's top 23 or 5 percentile of the class. So I've, I've managed, but the notion that I or others who are well documented as different learners are going to learn and be tested the same way as somebody else is a ridiculous notion. So next week when I sit down for the like four hour park exam and my teacher's tenure is weighed on how well I do, let's see how much this really determines how successful I will be because I will still hopefully be here next week on live radio and I will still be as successful as I am in high school but maybe I won't do as good in the park exam and maybe that will prove how foolish these tests are is that someone who does academically as well as I do and does as poorly as I do on tests there's got to be an imbalance here I mean we are not standard people. Don't treat us that way. and Don't test us that way. That's what I like to put it. But then again, I would love to hear your thoughts. And now, I mean, if we think about it carefully and rationally, it is stupid and it doesn't make sense. And today I have shown two areas where I am upset with Barack Obama. So I am a little... Uh, God, you! everyone listening must really think that um, I have thrown away my liberal card because I've denounced Obama twice today. I am actively pro-nuclear power. But I promise you I am a liberal. And I'm a liberal because I, I want things to be properly regulated so that my friends, my family, our country is not hurt. And so that things are more efficient. Okay? We put millions and millions of dollars into these tests and i don't know what we get out of them we just find out that certain kids can't test certain ways and now largely they can't get into any good college that they want because so many schools weigh these tests as so much but again the tide might be changing but again tell me how you feel about that uh i really do want to know uh, and i'd like to just pose a question i want to know how many people think uh, I did a recent thing on, uh, uh, well, actually, maybe I'll say that for another time. Uh, I do want to talk about climate change real quick. You see, uh, I'm kind of jumping shifts, uh, ships here. I, I kind of thought the GMO clip would last longer, but I guess I uh, didn't budget my time properly. But I have a teacher who doesn't believe in climate change. So for my economics project, I am displaying how climate change, I'm basically doing an economic analysis of climate change. And, you know, I, I don't get it because the, the guy says the science isn't there yet. Well, if anybody wants to give me facts about climate change, please do so because I've already given facts from NOAA from NASA, from the United States military. I've given sources such as Michio Kaku, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, famous scientists, even Bill Nye, who's not even really a good scientist. He's a TV show host, but he did go to Cornell. And still, the science isn't there. He tells me I cherry pick my arguments, but if you want to talk about cherry picking your arguments, only 3% of scientists agree with him. So, I don't know. Um, I mean... 
it, let's just be solid on the facts that climate change is real. And if you look at the graphs, it, it's indisputable. Yeah, I, you know, I'm going off on a random. I'm sorry, everyone. It's been a while. Uh, but anyways, so back to my uh, my main topic here on this standard assess, I guess we can get back to it, is, you know, we're going to test students, but why don't we push students towards, you know, woodworking? It, why don't we bring that back? Uh, why don't we bring back the ideas of plumbing? And I know we, we should rebuild vocational schools in regions. I'm not saying bring them back to your school specific, but at least make a school within the region a magnet school that students interested in that can go to. Because I know a kid who, uh, I, don't know, I won't give his name, but uh, he he loved uh, actually building things and he wanted to be a mechanic for Audi. Now, what is a kid like that doing in Algebra 2? Come on. I get it that we should all know these skills. But you want to be real here. When is this kid ever going to... And you know where he is now? Unfortunately, he's gotten into a lot of trouble because he hates school. He never does his schoolwork. And I don't blame him. And now he's uh, suffered. He's in juvenile detention center. And uh, just think about that. Is that I wonder what would have changed if we actually fostered what this kid wanted to learn. And I don't think that he failed education. I think education failed him. I think there's a huge undertaking that needs to be done in our education system so that it's largely based upon students growing with what they want. I mean, to an extent, I do think that we should all be learning uh, math, science, history, that we should be learning the arts as well. And I think we stray away from these ideas, but think about it this way. I learned biology uh, sophomore year. I learned physical science freshman year. I'm learning chemistry my junior year. But then after this year, we'll forget it. So I don't understand why we don't grow with the topics. I know that in India, they have, you take biology one, then you take biology two, biology three, biology four. And you move up every single day with the different uh, every single year with different biology courses, but you also move up in from physics one, two, three, and they rotate every day between physics, biology, chemistry, astronomy. So why don't we do that? I mean, that seems really smart if we want to master sciences and we want to master uh, that field. But this whole notion of, you know, the no child left behind and common core, they don't work. They really don't. And I understand the ideology behind it and because I don't want some classroom in Mississippi teaching about, uh, you know, Adam and Eve and that we should all be standard to understand that science happened this way or whatever. But let's be clear. The government, the federal government has no right to dictate how our education is conducted in this nation, in this nation. And Common Core doesn't actually do that because uh, uh, each state kind of ratified Common Core, or at least the states that did, I believe it was 43. But even so, leave it up to the states and localities, because I, I do think that as long as it's regulated of what they can and cannot learn, then it, it'll be better. Because again, we, we don't want some school way down in the deep Mississippi teaching about, you know, creationism is how it happened. Also, you know what bothers me about our education system is is that in health class in a lot of states they don't learn about uh, certain sexual activities and we wonder why teen pregnancy is so high in this country when compared to others we wonder why uh, STDs are so high when compared to others other nations it's because we don't educate our students on that so you know what that'll segue me into my next topic about how we can reduce STDs and pregnancy in this country in regard to teen and high school setting. Is that, I will give you a full disclosure. I think that if a teenager, uh, you know, wants to go down, a female wants to go down to the nurse's office and get plan B, she should be able to. She should be able to uh, have access to uh, getting at least or signing up for birth control with her school nurse. 
There should be condoms in every single vending machine in schools. We should be teaching kids how to properly use uh, these, how, how to properly use condoms or uh, birth control, things of this nature. We should be teaching them all about the different types of sexual acts, but we don't. And then we wonder why we have such a big turnover on teen pregnancies and uh, all these STDs. I know that in the New York, in the greater New York area, one in every, I believe it was four person of, of the age of 19 to 28 has some type of either dormant or active STD. Yikes. That is very scary. That is very uh, traumatic for people who hear these uh, statistics. And you just wonder, why is it like that? Maybe it's because we're not educating kids properly. We're not taking precautions to stop this from spreading. Um, so just kind of wrap your mind around that, maybe. Uh, I'm less mad about Obama on that than I am on the other two topics. But, you know, you, you see people like Rush Limbaugh calling that girl a slut in 2012 because she wanted access to birth control. Uh, and I know this is a different setting because that was company setting, this was school setting. But I think schools do have an obligation to look out for their kids. And I don't, I think that the whole, what I said was kind of radical, uh, having condoms and vending machines. But um, I think that it should be based on uh, local agendas. And that is my main point here, is that we shouldn't be discouraging acts that are going to happen anyway. Uh, this kind of rides along with the marijuana argument. Why legalize it when you can make profit off of it and make it safer anyway. But ultimately, let's be real here, this stuff happens anyway and you want to avoid teen pregnancy, you want to avoid uh, STD growth, then actually take prevention. Because the whole idea of, you know, abstinence, this, whatever, that's, that's not going to work. I mean, there are those who will stick to that, but there are those who won't. And we might as well make it safe for those who don't. Because I I really don't want to see friends, family, uh, people across the country having issues because they weren't educated on it. So, again, we educate uh, just in this overall rant on our poor education system. We educate students on math, science and, and uh, some history. I mean, just we, we target math and science and then we leave out a lot of big things. We leave out uh, the need to understand vocations such as, you know, uh, woodworking, plumbing, electricity, uh, electrical power, whatever. Uh, we don't foster kids to go where they want to go. We teach them to a test. We don't teach kids actual ways to be safe when they get out there in the real world. I'll put that one nicely. We do a lot of things that don't actually prepare kids. We teach to a test. That test carries them on to college, to wherever they go. And from that college, it's really determinant on what the kid does. But, you know, my grandmother always says it this way. She says, the school doesn't make the student. The student makes the school. And in college, to a large extent, I agree. But when the school makes the test for the student, that is when there's a problem. Because it should be the opposite. The kid should be making his own uh, education for the school and the school accommodates the student. And that is really what we need to start focusing on in this nation is fostering creativity in a way that is so great. And you know what? We, we already do to a large extent do this because and don't go looking at those graphs that says, you know, we are number 23 in education because we're not. OK. We're not. We're not 23 in education or whatever you want to call it. China is not number one. India is not number two. Finland is not number three. Because at least in China and India, they only test the best students. They only test the number ones, the ones who made it into their school. Here we test everybody across the board. I think we should stop worrying about that statistic of who's number one, who's 23. And we should start focusing more on how well students are growing here, because that is the biggest problem, is that we don't worry about who's number one in America and who should be number one in here in America should be 
the students. I mean, I know that there's this one statistic that's pretty scary. I'm going to start winding it down here. But we put $62,000 on average to a inmate in prison a year. And the average student gets nine to $12,000 a year per student. So we really need to look at our priorities. We need to look at how we're teaching. We need to look at what we're teaching. We need to look at how effectively we're teaching. And we need to look at how can we foster creativity among uh, our students. Because I largely, I, I greatly believe that kids and students want to be successful. But there are certain students who just don't want to be successful in math and science, and I don't blame them. And there are certain students who just want to live their life understanding how to do uh, start an engine or do something else, and I don't blame them. So I think our education system needs change, and we need to change it really quickly because Common Core doesn't work. And you know what scares me most is that I just heard Donald Trump saying those exact same words that Common Core doesn't work, but he said it with his lips really close together and his hairpiece almost falling off. Anyways, uh, today's show wasn't very prepared. A lot of it was a little candid, but um, uh, next week I will come at you ready to fire and we will talk about the hard topics. Uh, I'm not sure yet what, but I do know that they will be very good, very well prepared, and I will have a guest next week. This week, I did have a guest, guest canceled, unfortunately. Uh, next week, I think I'm going to do a throwback to an episode where I talked about money and politics, because I actually met a uh, fr uh, a guy uh, at a convention I was at in Washington, D.C., and uh, he was with this... Yeah, let me just get the card, actually. He, his name is uh, James Errol, and he's with the stamp... Uh, He's with the Stamp Money Out of Politics, uh, basically, group. And I actually got a stamp that I've been stamping my money with, my actual dollar bills with. And it says, Stamp Money Out of Politics. And apparently it's all legal. And uh, the money, I mean, uh, money, every dollar bill is seen by about 800 people a year. So it really gets the message out, I hope. But in addition to that, uh, you know, I think this guy really gets it. So I'm going to reach out to him, uh, see if he can come on. If not, we'll talk about something else. But um, in closing of today's episode, I, I kind of want to recap because in the end, I was a little all over the board. Look at what you're eating. Don't be, don't be too fearful. But uh, next time you step into an election booth uh, or a uh, voting booth, excuse me. Just think about who you're voting for and what they stand for and be very careful of their background. Because maybe we'll end up with somebody who promises labeling and ends up appointing the former vice president of uh, Monsanto's whatever department. Be careful of what you're eating. Be careful of who's making it, what is making it. And be careful of how it is raised. Because don't I don't want anybody eating pesticides, okay? Finally, in regard to education, I did a really big rant on this. But, you know, when we're going to school every day and we're learning the same crap over and over again, just think about all the students who are failing, who aren't doing well, because A, they were taught to a test that they never wanted to take, and they're being educated on stuff they never wanted to learn. I mean, these are things that, you know, society needs to look at very carefully and realize that not everybody wants to be a mathematician, not everyone wants to be a scientist, and we need to start shaping education around the individual. But anyways, for this week, I'm Bryce Robbins. I can't wait to be back next week, and I'm sorry I missed out last week. But I'm back. I'll be here to stay, here to chat. And definitely hit me up on uh, OPNAT News, Opinion Nation News on Twitter, Opinion Nation News on Facebook, or even at Robbins Bryce on my personal Twitter. Hit me up. I want to hear more comments. 
uh, about the show. I want to hear all about your opinions because this is your nation. I want your opinions. It is your news. Okay, uh, Rick, if you could just take us out as you always so gratefully do. All right, folks, that will wrap up Opinion Nation for today. Uh, of course, hosted by uh, Bryce Robbins. I am Rick Robinson. I'll be right back with you here in just a few minutes with the usual Saturday edition of America Off the Rails. Again, that one will be probably slightly abbreviated. As you can hear, I am actually almost back to normal, but after about 30, 45 minutes of me constantly railing, it starts to again sound like I'm a little old man with emphysema. So that one will probably run for about maybe an hour. I'm probably going to start at around 11, 10, 11, 15. I did just get an alert that I need to make a phone call real quick. Um, so I'm going to deal with that, and then we'll be right back here with you guys. Again, just wanted to thank both Dave and Bryce for hanging out with me today on Finding Common Ground. And then Bryce, a uh, great show as always. And you know, sometimes, and this is just my little personal uh, perspective, sometimes when you feel that rant coming on, go ahead and run with it, brother. Like I, most of the time, if you're doing live radio, your shows are often going to go in a different direction than you choose. If, At least in my experience, if you don't fight that, it typically works out a little better for you anyway. At least that's how my shows roll anyway. But <clears throat> anyway, we will be back with you live here in just a little bit. Again, thanks for everybody who tunes in with us every Saturday morning right here on K98talk.com as well as the Spark Radio Network. I am Rick Robinson, Programming Director and Managing Partner around this joint, and I'll be back with you here in just a little bit. All right. So long. I'll see you all next week, everybody. Thank you so much, Rick. Take care, man.